Hey guys, welcome to Church on the Move, Broken Arrow Online. So excited that you are tuning in and watching this. My name is Joel, I'm one of the pastors here, and we're just excited about today's message. We have one of our teaching pastors here from Church on the Move, and his name is Ian Wilson, and you're in for a real treat. Let's check it out. There's no shortage of division in our world. These issues are both complex and deeply personal. We'd all say we want good in the world, justice and peace in our homes, our community, our country. We want unity, right? But who gets to define what that looks like? And as Christ followers, what does that require of us? What does it actually mean to be one? Hey, my name is Ian. I'm a pastor here at Church on the Move Broken Arrow. Thank you for taking a second to watch this week's message from COTMBA. I wanna just say uh, real fast, uh, whether you're watching because you couldn't make it this week or maybe you're just taking precautions and avoiding crowds, we're grateful that you're part of this. If you wanna connect in the season at all, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to us. BA at churchonthemove.com is an email address. If you have questions as you listen to this message today, if you wanna have a conversation about it, we're here for you and for your family and we're grateful for you. Uh, maybe you're just seeking, this season has maybe stirred some things up for you and you're wondering if maybe there's more and so you tuned into some something like this, a church thing, which maybe you never thought you would do, but you're here, that's for you too. If you wanna ask questions or, or you have some questions about some of the things we share today, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to us at ba at churchandmove.com. Well, today I'm gonna continue in a teaching series we've been in called One. We're talking about unity. Our God's desire is for His people to be united. In fact, Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 that His people would be one, that we would be a united people that are together and that love one another the way that He has loved us. And so we've been talking about major ideas with unity. And this week, we're talking about the power of words. Our words have so much power and so many implications in our life, in our relationships. And if we can get this right, if we get our words right, it has the ability to build our families, build our kids, uh, build the teams that we're in and build the environment around us. But if we get it wrong, we can tear down relationships, separate things that God never wanted to be separated. And we become the person that like no one wants to see coming when our words are harsh and critical and tear people down. And so we're gonna talk about the power of our words today. And most of what we're gonna get today is from a book of the Bible called James. Uh, James wrote it, that's why it's called James. And from chapter three, I'm gonna read a bunch of verses here and then I'll draw out four major thoughts from this. So this is James chapter three, verse two. It says this, we all stumble in many ways, very encouraging verse. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Then it goes on to say, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the entire animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. It's four ideas from this section of scripture in James chapter three. The first one is this, words are powerful. There's so much power in our words. James says that if we get a hold on our words, we can keep our entire body in check. God's the one who set the precedent for us with this. In the very beginning, if you go back to page one of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it says the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So here you have this unformed, unclear stuff and God is ready to bring light and order to things and the spirit of God is waiting to move and bring about this creative power and force to make things happen. But everything's waiting on something and it's waiting on God to speak. 
And the very next verse says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light, that it was good. God created everything we see by what he said. This is what Hebrews 11 tells us. Verse three says that by faith, we know that the worlds, like the whole universe was created by the word of God so that what we see was made out of something that's invisible. God's invisible words created the visible world that we see. But it doesn't end there. Later on in Genesis chapter one, God makes us, you and me, makes man, makes a woman. And he says, I've made them in my image and my likeness. And so now our words have power too. In fact, Proverbs 18 says it like this, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. There's death and life in the power of our tongue because our words are so powerful. God made everything with words and we can shape environments. We can influence relationships with what we say because there's so much power in our words. That's the first idea, words are powerful. Here's the second idea. Words may seem like a small thing, but they direct our entire life. Like how we, where we go and the direction of our life is determined by our words. This is how James says it. He says, we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us and we can turn the whole animal. The idea is there's this massive animal, so strong, so muscular, and yet something so small in its mouth can turn it wherever we want it to go. Uh, I've been, I've ridden horses twice in my life. The first time, by the way, I was in Colorado and the guy leading us was wearing a pair of chaps and a loincloth. So let God bless you with that visual for a second. Second time, I was on a beach with my wife, Jess, uh, and it sounded like it was gonna be a really fun, like romantic experience. Um, but the horse that Jess got on, they told us right before she got on it, this is the laziest horse that we have. And so this thing was going so slow. Every few feet, it would stop to like take a breather and like bend over. And so Jess was loving it. She's taking videos and pictures and all that kind of stuff. But within a few minutes, we were like 30 feet behind the people in front of us because her horse was so slow. And it was the perfect storm because the horse that we that I got on, the guy put me on it and he goes, hey, uh, just to give you a heads up, this one's a little rebellious. Like he's got a bit of a wild streak. He likes to go fast. He's a little anxious. And so we never put him at the front. We try to put him at the back. So we have Jess's horse, my wife, who's so slow and me and this crazy horse right behind her horse. And he's going nuts. Like he's ready to go. He's ready to like get out of the gate and take off. And he's got this lazy, slow horse right in front of him. And he starts getting antsy. At one point, he's like, Rawr! he's like grunting at Jess's horse. And Jess's horse starts kicking back and like kicking him in the chest and my horse is like flying. I'm like, I've never, I mean, this is only my second time to do this. But what amazed me is even in that time when this big wild animal is going all over the place, I could control it simply by this little bit that was in its mouth. Compared to me, he has so much more strength, but yet because I have control of his mouth, I can direct his entire body. And this is what the scripture says about us, that if we can get a hold of our tongue, it has the ability to direct our entire body life because words are that powerful. One of the things that I've learned uh, just in life, and you know this to be true as well, is that it's not just our words that direct our life, but other people's words direct our life as well. Uh, I went to college in Massachusetts. I was an ice hockey player. And the whole reason I went to college is uh, not to get a degree, it was to play hockey. That's what I wanted to do. I went with some of my buddies that had played together before. And so the schooling was sort of just like a necessary evil uh, along the way of getting to play hockey in college. Uh, and I'll never forget early on, I had this English professor who gave me a really bad grade the first time I turned in uh, a paper and I was shocked. I thought, man, like I did what I was supposed to do. I mean, yeah, I mean, I kind of fudged the double spacing a little bit, come on, just to meet the requirements. Um, but he gave me this bad grade and he sat me down and he said, Ian, I feel like you've got a lot of potential here, but I can tell you didn't put anything into this. And that's why I gave you a poor grade. It was like a real wake up call. And I had that guy for two semesters. And at the end of the second semester, he pulled me aside and he said, hey, I wanna talk to you for a second. He said, what are you getting a degree in? And I said, well, communication. And uh, he said, good. He said, there's something about you. You have a gift to write. And I think if you'll put your heart into it, um, you could do something with communication. I didn't see that coming. I wasn't even there to learn anything. I was just there to play hockey and I was just getting credits because you had to in order to play in college. And this guy said something and it changed direction for me. I started leaning in. I started giving more effort in the classes that I was in and it directed the course of my life because one guy that I don't even know was a Christian spoke life over me and I believed what he said. 
that's a good example of someone else's words directing our life. But I know for so many of us, our words have been directed in a bad direction because of other words that people have spoken over us. Every year as a church, uh, we do this thing called Real Jesus Weekend where uh, our Real Jesus small groups come together for an event and we worship together, we hear teaching and we pray over one another and we believe that God's gonna lead us to freedom. Uh, one of the exercises we do is what we call a label exercise. Everybody gets like a little name tag uh, and there's this huge cross on the stage. Everybody has to write down some of the false labels that we've received, things that people have spoken over us that we've received and that we've actually believed what they said. We have to write those labels down and go stamp them on the cross and then receive a new label of what God says about us. It's a very, very powerful exercise, but it never ceases to amaze me what I see on that cross when I look at the different name tags that are up there. Things like worthless, unwanted, unloved, not a leader is one I saw last time. And so many of us, in fact, all of us have heard words from people, whether it was a parent, a coach, a leader in your life, a sibling, a friend that have tore us down and it's directed the course of our life. But the good news is that God has truth for you and God said some things about you too. And when we receive his words, it directs us the right way. This is why I believe Jesus said in John chapter eight, if you remain in my word, like if you know what I said, then you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Like the lies will keep you held up and bound up from being who God wants you to be. But my truth will set you free so you can be who I've called you to be. And so that's why we believe so much in this, getting in the scriptures and studying, because when we hear God's word, words have the ability to direct our entire life. And when we know what he says about us, we can be on the path he wants us to be on. So that's the second thought, words direct our very life. The third thought is this, we can use our words to either build up or tear down. We've talked about how other people's words influence us, but the reality is your words influence other people too. And you have the opportunity to either use those words to build people up or to tear them down. Ephesians chapter four says this, let no corrupt word come out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification just means building people up so that you can impart grace to those who hear you. I think it's a fascinating verse because God's saying, hey, you can use your words to either tear down the people in your life or to build up the people in your life. Use your words to build them up. The, the scripture even says that it's necessary because the world around us just tears us down and we need each other to build one another up. Uh, this, this past week, I got to be at our student conference, Uncommon. It was unbelievable. But one of the things that we all experienced is we're just overwhelmed by how much the world just suppresses our students and our teenagers. It just naturally tears you down and leaves you depleted. And when we get to come together in an environment like that, we get to use our words to build each other up, to breathe fresh life into one another. And God's always wanted his people to be the kind of people that use our words to build one another up, not to tear one another down. And so how do you use your words in your marriage, with your kids, with the people around you? Do you use them to build each other up or do you use them to tear people down? Because your words have so much potential to influence the people in your life and you can use them for good or for evil. I'll never forget the I did premarital counseling uh, with my wife and I. We sat down with a guy that we deeply respect. His name is Pastor Brent. And he took us through five or six weeks of counseling. Uh, we needed it. And the very last week we were about to, to leave, we kind of wrapped everything up and he just, he paused real fast and he said, hey, don't ever forget this. He said, in the scriptures, Jesus is called our advocate. Like he's for us, he's for you, he's your advocate. The devil is called your accuser. He just points out what's wrong with you all the time. He accuses you all the time. The advocate and the accuser. And he said, when you think about what you say to one another, who do you sound like? And we just sat there like, oh gosh, honestly, not a whole lot like Jesus. And it's true for you too. You either sound like the advocate or the accuser in your relationships. Who do you sound like? because you can use your words to build people up. You know, I'll say one more thing about Ephesians chapter four. It says that when you use your words to build up, that you're putting grace into those who hear you. And the idea is grace is something you don't deserve. The people in your life might not deserve a kind word. They might not deserve someone loving them and speaking life over them. But God says, hey, I loved you. So love them and put grace into them too. 
Of course, there are times we need to stand up for truth and speak corrective words, but we do it in love. And so put grace into the hearts of those who hear you when you speak. Here's the final thought. Our words actually reveal what's really inside of us. Jesus said it like this in Luke chapter six. He said, out of the treasure that's stored up in your heart, either good things come out or evil things come out. He said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Like what's coming out of your mouth is coming from somewhere and it's actually coming from your heart. And so your words are kind of like an EKG. If you wanna know what's going on in your heart, just pay attention to your words because that's what's really going on in your heart. If your words are harsh, if they're bitter, it's because something's going on in here. But the good news is that Jesus came to heal our hearts, to make us whole so that we could be whole and be able to speak life over people. One of the things that Jesus said is he said, a good tree produces good fruit. Then he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So he makes this reference to trees. And in the very, very beginning, God created everything. If you haven't heard this story before, he creates this garden. He puts Adam, the man that he had made in it. And in the middle of this garden, there's these two trees. And I think today we're eating from one of these two trees. We're storing up in our heart, putting into our heart, the fruit from one of these two trees. And whatever we put in our heart is eventually what comes out of our mouth. One tree was called the tree of life. The other tree was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and when I, early on, when I first read that, I thought, okay, tree of life is good. The tree of the knowledge of e good and evil, that's like, that's awful, that's sin. That's like, you know, kind of like rap music and R-rated movies. Just like, stay away from that tree. Don't go, go anywhere near that. Go to the tree of life, right? But it's not called the tree of sin. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which at first glance is not a bad, I mean, it seems like a good thing. Like we, we wanna know what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's evil. But God says, if you eat from that tree in the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. When you eat from this tree, it produces death and not just physical death, death to relationships, death to dreams. It cuts off connections that God wants us to have with other people when we eat from the wrong tree. I want you to just stop and think for a second about what you're consuming in your life, what you're feeding on, what you constantly see, what you constantly hear. Does it sound like life? Or does it sound a little bit more like the knowledge of good and evil? This is right, this is wrong. No, this is right, this is wrong. What's the news that you watch kind of sound like? What's your social media feed look like? You should watch this video because this guy tells it like it is and he's right. Or no, 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 that's awful, that's evil. This is right because whatever you consume is eventually gonna come out of your mouth. And I find that so many of us in these days are consuming this knowledge of good and evil and it's producing division in us. What happens when you, when you consume this so much is what the devil said to Eve when he tempted her, he said, no, 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 she said, it, well, God told us that if we eat from this tree, we die. And the devil said, no, 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 you won't die. He said this, if you eat from this tree, you'll be like God and you'll know good and evil. And when you feed on this tree a lot, you start to sound like someone that's trying to be God. We stop speaking in conversation and we start making verdicts. No, this is how it is. Hey, I just got on social media because somebody had to straighten all this out. So I'm making the verdict, this is the, how it is. And you should just believe that and follow me because someone has to make a judgment about this. Usually that's God's job. Fortunately, I can tell you how it should be. This is what we sound like. And it's easy to see that kind of on social media, but it happens in our relationships too, like face-to-face -face relationships. When your spouse comes to you and maybe corrects you or you're having a conversation, instead of going, man, I see it a different way. Can we talk about this? You step into the God, no, 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 no. This is how it is. You're wrong, get out. I have no time to listen to you. Because we've been feeding on the wrong tree and our hearts are full of the wrong thing. And so the wrong stuff comes out of our mouth. But God has a better way for us. Instead of this knowledge of good and evil, God has a tree of life. You know what it sounds like? It sounds an awful lot like Romans 5, 8 that says, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The tree of life says, man, I was messed up. I was so broken. I was an enemy of God. And yet in that moment, God loved me perfectly. And if that's how God loved me, man, I can love you too, even if I don't agree with you, even if I see things differently. Can I speak up for what's right? Absolutely I can, but I'm doing it from a place of love because I know that it's the truth that makes us free. So I'm passionate about the truth because I don't want you to be in bondage anymore. I want you to be free. I want you to be liberated. And so even my speaking of truth is not to put you down. It's because I love you so much because God loved me. 
It reminds me of 1 John chapter 4 that says, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and gave his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then it says, beloved, if God so loved us, then we also should love one another. When you come to the tree of life, when you consume that, you start to go, gosh, if God loved me when I was at my worst, if God gave me his best when I was at my worst, man, I can speak words of life and words of grace to you because that's what God's done for me. And so when you consume that, your heart begins to be overwhelmed with the love and the grace of God and it starts to come out of your mouth and all of a sudden your words are life-giving. They're putting life in the hearts of the people who hear you and building them up. You're like a thermostat that's changing the temperature of every room you walk into because your words impart life. So here's kind of the practical application for this week, three things. Number one, ask the question, what tree am I consuming? Like, where am I going to? By the way, I'm not saying you shouldn't watch the news or be on social media. I think you should be well-informed of what's going on. And I don't even think it's wrong to develop opinions about things. I think you should investigate and study things, but what are you consuming? And what's consuming you? Is it this knowledge of good and evil or is it life? Because when you consume life, man, and the love of Jesus, it starts to flow out of you. Second thing is this, receive God's life-giving words over you because God said some good things about you. He says you're his son. He says you're his daughter. He says he loved you. He says you're accepted in the beloved. He says that he's taken away all of your sins and declared you right before him once and for all because of what Jesus has done. When you start to receive those life-giving words, man, it transforms you and you can start speaking life-giving words to others. So take time this week to receive what God has said about you. Get in the scripture. And again, don't approach the scripture from the wrong tree. Don't come to it like, okay, knowledge of good and evil. It's good for me to read this, so I better read it. I better read it X amount of minutes. No, 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 no. Come to it like a tree of life. I'm here to receive life and wholeness. God wants to do something good in my heart. So I'm coming to open this up and to receive the life-giving words that he has for me. Receive his life-giving words for you. And then lastly, use your words this week. I have two toddlers, and so I say this all the time use your words like use them use them for good use them to build people up use them to impart life to people man if you need to apologize to someone if you need to encourage someone let your words be life-giving to the people in your life and when you do you'll see god begin to transform the relationships and the environments that you are in because here's what proverbs 15 says last verse says a wholesome tongue a tongue that when i use it right it makes you whole a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. When you receive God's love and grace for you, you can freely give it to other people and impart life to them with your words. So let's be that kind of people this week and use our words to build others up. We love you. Thanks for taking a second to watch this. Again, thank you so much for watching and being a part of our online community and just being a part of what our church is doing all over the world. We love you guys. If you need anything from us, text BA to 23101. Subscribe, comment. We can't wait to see you guys again.